me. I listened to like the, the beat of it was like me going into the hurdles so that yeah. I was focused on my rhythm going into there is the world. But yes. most importantly is the food, it's 24 seven. It's 24 seven. So it's like, I did not look happy standing on the podium, <laughs> which I really should have, you know, took more, um, I should have paid more attention to it because, you know, those pictures will be there forever. But I was very happy with what I'd done. It just didn't look like I was excited. But those moments that was behind the scenes that helped got me there. Right. The bridge, the loss of loved ones and all the other things. I started thinking on the podium and I looked up and I said, Dad, you can actually now rest in peace when my father passed. That you there's me here, a.k.a. the speed doctor over there. Give it away, Mr. D-Pain. D-Pain TV in the building. What's good with it? <laughs> so we're back again for the Olympic edition, my friend. Let's talk about the village. During the Olympics, um, some of us stayed in the village. Some of the superstar was able to stay outside of the, the village to isolate themselves in hotels with their doctors, with their entourage. Uh, where did you stay? Did you stay inside the village? Um, I did stay inside the village. Uh, it was really nice. They, uh, like, obviously they built the whole village for us, but each country had their own building, right? Yeah. And um, you saw you saw all the athletes going in and out of the buildings, but when you, the buildings basically were like, you know, different floors, but you had on like maybe the middle floor was like where all the athletes came, hos hos athlete hospitality. And then you also had like trainers there. And obviously there was security at the, at the front door. Um, but it just made it feel like you were at a camp, an elite camp. You know, um, everybody who was everybody, you just walked past them and everybody dealt with the same conditions. That's also something that, you know, made you feel like, okay, we're going to do this together. Um, and it was fun to go down to the main uh, floor where hosp athlete hospitality was and cheer for our, our all of the athletes in all the different events. And you bonded with people, you met people, became friends with people. And I mean, the village was awesome. That's exactly what it was. And you could go to the other um, other buildings and countries as long as you had your badge. That was yeah. very important. You couldn't lose your badge. You had to have your badge. Your badge got you into the cap. It got you into the doors everywhere you needed to go. But um, it was a great experience. And I mean, that was part of the whole experience. You know, Olympics is not just going there to compete. It's meeting all the people. It's all the world-class athletes. It's the humongous um, world-class facilities and the experience in itself. So it was amazing. Now, you make the team. Did you get your Olympic package before you left the United States or when you arrived? How many bags of stuff did you get? And um, so when you make the U.S. team, basically, as soon as you make the U.S. team, before the end of the day, after you go through doping, they take you into the back room where you, you fill out all your waivers and all your forms. You go to each little section and then you take a shopping cart, literally, oh. and you walk down like three aisles and they're just putting... I mean, you're overwhelmed. I mean, you open up the Olympic bag, it's so many outfits in there, so many styles, so many different things to run in, gym shoes, hoodies, all of that. And I mean, and I believe Ralph Lauren and Polo are doing the Olympic, I mean, they always do a good job, always. So, but yeah, you have a bag full of stuff. And uh, for the most part, people get it before they leave, but there are some athletes that may get it when they arrive. But as long as you get it, that's all that matters. <laughs> well, it's like the Oscar. You know, right. you get your fancy bag and all the swags and all the, right. the gifts and goodies. Oh, no, that's one of my favorite parts. Um, you get a couple suitcases of stuff, try on things you've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. uh, big brands that you drop in the stuff so they can be advertised and embellish, uh, trying to get on the athlete's body and all that stuff. Right. So, uh, that's one of my favorite part as well. The uh, village to me, I enjoy because I get to network and meet people from all over the world, right. so different backgrounds, different colors, different sizes, um, all the stuff involved. And my favorite part, away from taking the golf cart because I hate, I hate walking around the village. <laughs> it's so big. Um, yeah, it so is I got big. My, I got it my own big. VIP golf cart. Right, right, <laughs> right, and. 
is going to the different food venues and tasting foods from around the world. But yes. most importantly is the food, it's 24-7. It's 24-7. So people who don't have access to this type of food, they can gain 10, 15 pounds within three days. <laughs> people get people get out of the shape within yeah, the first you definitely, five, seven days at the Olympics or worlds if you don't watch your diet. But you know what? The food is really good, though, because when I went, you know, they had like age, every different type of food in the world they had, literally, and it was good. So it was easy to gain a couple pounds if you didn't watch your weight. And um, they actually had several different um, cafeterias on the village. And so I had a favorite one. We used to call it Waffle House. And so I'll be like, yo, we meet at Waffle House and we will meet at the, the East um, Calf. But yeah, the food was good. You had to watch out. So other than the waf Waffle House, what was one of your favorite food or or um, ethnic area you wanted to eat at? What, what was your yes. favorite? And, and did you try anything new? Why or why not you didn't try stuff new? Um. Well, so I like, you know, I, I can only eat so, certain things because I have acid reflex really bad. So I'm really picky with what I try, but I did really like the Korean food. The Korean food was so good. I mean, they had the chicken and rice and the, and the fried chicken. And, and I didn't really eat like that until afterwards. I stayed very just like a uh, baked chicken or grilled chicken with some pasta or something like that. Um, but afterwards I did go in and the Korean food was amazing. Um, um, I love I love the Italian food too, but the Korean food stood out because like I could eat that all the time. And so I probably ate there every, every day I could after I was done with the competition. So it was good. What about you? I definitely enjoy multiple areas because I, I call myself an international brother, you know? I'm, right. like, the, I'm like the black James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I want to try different cuisine and I play around in the kitchen now based on that uh, that concept. So um, I like the European, I, but once again, I still got to bring my own little sauce up in there. <laughs> Sometimes a little bit yeah, of right <laughs> right, uh, the Brazilian, uh, absolutely. I, I was in the Canadian side, but yes. I'm hey, where's my Jamaican food at? <laughs> right, yeah, uh, because I know, um, the Jamaican crew brought their own chef during the yes. Olympic stuff, so yeah. give us an opportunity to test out those. And absolutely, I, I love everything Asian, um, yeah. the Japanese, the Chinese, the Thai. I they, like they, the they had a um, cuisine. they had a, a really good West Indies, um. Um, little, you know, side too. So that was great. Yeah. And for me, I try not to touch too much things that I don't know too much because especially when I'm competing, because I don't want to get upset stomach or, or change right, my, right. my balance. But soon yeah. I was finished, yeah. it was eat time. It was time for me to gain weight because one thing I know for a fact, I know a lot of athletes within the first five, seven days that either do well, well diet wise or the other half gained 10, 15 pounds and wonder what happened. How am I right. performing so badly and so slowly? <laughs> right. Just keep you can't eating. let that happen, though. Yeah. And they're yeah. taking food to the room and bends and all of a sudden, things start escalating. But but I you know what, though? But you know what, though? Um, being that is at the Olympics, it's different at the Olympics because, like you said, a lot of people don't have the ability to eat like that. And even when you go to the Diamond League meets or the big meets, yeah. they're done eating at 9 or 10. So I can imagine people thinking, you know, I'm going to go back to my room and I'm going to take as much stuff as possible. But the good thing was they were always open. It was 24 yeah. hours. So that was something you never had to worry about. You can get up and go eat. If you, if you couldn't sleep at night, you could go grab some fruit and yogurt or whatever. Yeah. And there was never a worry about that. Some of them will think the food's going to run out, but the food will not right. run out, folks. The food right. will not run out. It's like an all-inclusive, nonstop, 24-7. <laughs> right all right so we touch on the food we touch on the village now when it was time to compete what was it like for you the very first time you touched the track in, the, in that stadium um even as a practice or and then competition i don't i'm not sure if you were able to practice on the same facility that you're going to sprint or they had a warm-up right. facility Right. Give me your experience. What was that like? Did you what what was um, your, the energy, the music? So the the 
American team kind of went out a cu- like a week, I think, before a week or two before the Olympics so that they could train at the facility. Um, I, I can't remember. I think it was at Beijing University. But when I got there, it was like maybe like a week later than when they already got there. So I was able to get like one or two training sessions on the practice track or, or like maybe like five or 10 minutes away. But they really didn't let us onto the track to use it until the day that you were going to run. And then they let you go out there and maybe warm up. But for the most part, it was when the, when the time was ready for you to get on the track and do the thing, then they allowed you to. They had so many other spaces for you to, you know, train and warm up. Um, but I am the type of person who likes to get out on the track that I'm going to be running at to feel it and see, you know, even get in the lane that I'm going to be running in and mentally focus about my lane and walk up and down the lane. So yeah. um, they allowed you to do it. But I, I, I think that they should actually allow you to do it when you first come so people can get acclimated to the actual track. But yeah, yeah that was my experience. What kind of music did you use to, for your warm up and stuff? Oh, man. I, I got a, a I got a nice little eclectic palette. So uh, like, you know, I, I listened to like, you know, we listened to Migos like when, when it first came on. But like back then, I also was listening to T Pain. And yeah. of course I was listening to Jay Z and Lil Wayne and and you know, hype music to just, you know, focus you. But then I will also I also listen to like classical music if you believe it. Um and it would just really <laughs> it would really calm me down and Um, when I trained with uh, David Oliver and Brooks Johnson at the Wild World of Sports, Brooks yeah. Johnson, who was an amazing coach, he's probably coached 15 to 20 Olympic athletes, gold medalists over his career. Um, he taught us how to work on our breathing. Yeah. And I use that to the music to like instantly when I hear classical music now, my whole mood just it kind of fizzles down to, you know, being very calm. And it actually helps because. You know, our, our heart rates drop when we, when we try to really focus. And when we yeah. did that every day, we took like 20 minutes, 15 minutes to every day before practice to try to slow our heart rates down. Um, and the classical right. music actually helped me with that. But yeah, I was hype and then I was classical. So I was trying to, you know, control my mood before my run. So what, what was you listening to? Oh, you don't want to know, man. First, <laughs> I I, uh, I got my boy. uh I like worldly music as well. Right. Some in slow motion. Okay, okay, okay. Some Phil Collins, you know. Boom, 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 right. Boom. See, right? you want that? You want that dramatic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then, yeah. You know, I get back in the. Right, right, yeah. Without the weed, by the way. Without the weed. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you can listen to Bob Marley without that. Hey, 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 hey. So what? Hey, 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 hey. hey. Big tune, Bob. Drop it on them one more time. Hey. Roll out. Roll out. Hey, so so when when you listen to the music. What was the effects that the music had before you competed? So I may do the um, Phil Collins and a jock, right? Then after that, when I'm doing some dynamic stretch, right? And some and statics combination and stretch, I've got some Bob Marley to work on the heart rate, right? And once again, it says the natural, the natural mystic, I'm thinking of the air, the surroundings. And then I'm going through doing my warm up. I'm dropping some Jimmy Cliff, and it says, Okay. Out of the cup, out of the fall. Okay. Competitors now. Right. And then right after I'm finished my warm up, I drop down to once again your style of music, some opera. Right. Okay. I drop in Bocello. Okay. Um, I think I have one here uh, where I drop in the Bocello. Uh, let, me, let me just do a little spell check here. Uh, but that's but that's interesting though, because like every athlete has their own has their own, you know, their flow. And yeah. so, you know, what the music that you listen to, I, I think music is very important because it sets the mood. 
and the tone before you actually compete. So, you know, and there's a variety, like there's songs that I hear people listen to and I'm be like, what in the hell are they listening to? But I can't <laughs> hate because it's getting them ready for whatever yep. that is that they have to do, you know, like. It's balancing the brains, balancing yeah. the, chem the, yeah. um, the, the chemistry in the body, the ambiance and All of that. the control and yes. the warm up and the process. And then also, um this listening to music that also is similar to your cadence in your run for me i listened to like the, the beat of it was like me going into the hurdles so that yeah. i was focused on my rhythm going into it. Go. So it became a dual reason like multiple reasons why i would listen to certain songs and it would get me yeah. ready and focused so uh, you, know, you know you know what I, what what i enjoy after um after all that is done i'm a, i'm gonna hook you up this is what I enjoy after all of that um, going in. Uh, I play this. Turn some fuck to this. Non stop turn on Chris. So you. Okay. Here we go. Champion song. Walk like a champion. Talk like a champion. Hey. Okay. <laughs> and that's the attitude piece. Right, right. I'm, we're gonna wrap this up, and I'm gonna put and all my walk, all my moves. I gotta have the championship walk. I gotta have the aura, right. the ambiance. When people look at me, they gotta know I got championship all glowing on me. You just look for second place. Don't look for first place. Got it's all here in my budget man. Got you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the music could do that for you. For oh real. yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, folks. Don't forget, we do not hate the Olympic movements. We might dislike certain things that are happening, but we love the Olympics. It's a prestige. It's four years, but the playing field is not right for everyone. The plat right? It's not. It's not win, 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 win for everyone. It's mostly win, win for them. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about those at times. But don't think we're bashing or haters of the Olympic and Olympic movement, right? We enjoy it, but yeah. we need to make sure going forward we have some balance. The world is changing, and we want them to change with the world. What's happening? Equality, equality. Right. So now, tell me a little bit about when you were getting your medal. What did uh, the energy feel like leading into the medal presentation? So getting the medal I mean, around your neck. After that, yeah. what was it like? I would say getting the medal put around my neck was one of the moments just like walking into the stadium. You know, every person that's trying to get to the Olympics envisions themselves putting their head down and having them put that medal around their neck. So that was awesome. I mean, that was a culmination of all my hard work. Um, but on the podium, like, I was bothered because obviously I wanted to run faster and I wanted to be closer to Dayron because even though I got second, he was well in front of me and the other American. So I was just disappointed in myself. And when I look back at the pictures, like I did not look happy standing on the podium, <laughs> which I really should have, you know, took more. Um, I should have paid more attention to it because, you know, those pictures will be there forever. But I was very happy with what I'd done. I just didn't look like I was excited, but those moments, man, you'll never, you know, get that moment again. You know, you might have, you might make it to the Olympics again if you're very fortunate, but that moment on the, the, the podium and just like in that moment, um, you'll, you'll only have it once. So, but it was great that I, I was able to feel that putting that medal around. That was, that was, probably one of the best feelings outside of walking into the stadium is actually achieving the medal and, and receiving it. Yeah. You know, um, for me, um, I always, um, in practice, I always play the song. Oh. Uh, they played that at the World Juniors in okay. back in uh, 88 uh, when uh, Andre Kaysan competed. Um, the guy blew up the track, 10.08, a little short. Yeah, I know Andre. I know Andre. He trained <laughs> right, in so, Virginia. 
So every time after that, when I'm on the track training, I had a DJ. That was my training partner. Okay. And he always played this song at the end of practice to remind me what it's going to be like to go into the podium. Right? That's, that's dope. That's right? dope. So when we called the team together and you had uh, the whole Canadian posse, we had the U.S. crew next next beside us. All I keep hearing, John Jumman and uh, Dennis Mitchell. We did not lose. We did not lose. We got a silver. We got a silver. I have said a silver is a loss. <laughs> but Silver's they will lost. not admit. They will not admit they lost. <laughs> hey, put it like this. A silver is a loss, but when you go back to your country, it's, it's a win. win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he will not accept that. I get it. Right. 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 Um, but overall, um, I, so I log back into that memory of that song and coming out and say we did it and seeing all the people in the chairs yeah right yeah. and going behind the podium and they call your name and i jump up and you know to put the medal around my neck yeah kiss it try to bite it up check to see make sure there's real there's no yeah. chocolate dripping right. out there and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> right and <laughs> looked around and says yes thank you lord you know, yes. yep. um, all the hard work, although I'm with my teammates, but individually, all the people that was behind the scenes that helped got me there. Right. The injuries, the loss of loved ones and all the other things. I started thinking on the podium yeah, and I looked up and I said, Dad, you can actually now rest in peace when my father passed. That Your son is becoming a man. Uh, you don't have to worry anymore. And, you know, just to look around the whole stadium and. One of my, as I said, one of my favorite songs, you know, I'm wearing the red. I'm promoting my Canada right now, right, is the Canadian anthem. Well, that's one of my favorite moments during the Olympics mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. hearing your anthem play. Absolutely. Because guess what? It's, it's your moment. Absolutely. Right? It's your work that made that song play. That Absolutely. That pride and joy right. to the whole nation. Right. Stand up. Right. When I move, you move. Just like hey, that. Hey, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the best sleep I ever had. Once I got that medal and went back home that night yeah. to my village dorm, wherever we were staying, it was like, oh my God, I could finally relax because the whole four years of that was me working to get that. And there was no relaxing any part of any day at any time until that moment. And then finally it was like, oh, I can relax for maybe a week because then I got a meet to go to or in a couple of days I'm flying out to somewhere else. But um, yeah, I, it was it was like the best sleep ever. Yeah. The best sleep yeah. ever. You know, um, I'm thinking about the medals. Making to the Olympics is phenomenal in itself. To make the finals is huge. And then now to be amongst the top three medalists mm -hmm. is wow. Yeah. You winning, that's one in what? One, five, five, six billion? <laughs> yeah, right? that's crazy. And I want to make sure the athletes and the media and all the other people around and whatever the expectations are, any medal should be celebrated with love, joy, and excitement. Absolutely. Because of those accomplishments. I don't want to hear any media say, are you disappointed? It's up to that individual who made their own personal goals right, right. of whatever that may happen, may feel disappointed. But hopefully I don't hear um, the media using a lot of, are you disappointed? What happened out there? Right. Let it go. <laughs> right. I feel like if you're, if you're an Olympian, that's it right there at the point where you've made it to congratulations every time you speak to someone because becoming an Olympian is freaking hard in itself. And then when you start meddling, it becomes like, oh, wow, okay, you're top in the world. And there's nothing you can say else about that. But I do feel um, once you made it to that upper echelon of athletes, I mean, it's still a great moment because I know many athletes who either broke the world record or American record or was close to it, but just didn't do it on the day that was meant for the Olympics to happen. But they're a world uh, gold medalist or they're an American uh, champion. And yeah or a champion for their country, and it just didn't happen for them. So to be an Olympian is a feat in itself, so. Now, 
let's take a look at your race. What was it like for you? Uh, how many rounds did you have? Three or four during the Olympics? Um, I think we had three. Okay. So what was it like for you? Three of the finals and finals. In the heats? What was it like for you in the semi? And what was it like for you in the finals? Break me down those right. three stages, um, what you did in between, all that stuff, and bring me through that race. What did that feel like? Right. Uh, so I knew that I was going to have a, a hefty task regardless because Lu Shang and Terrence Chamel were running along with David Oliver and Davon Robles. And those four people right there were going to be my toughest competition um, to get a medal. I was going to have to beat one of them and run a PR maybe to do it. Um, but then also Lu Shang got injured and Terrence Chamel got injured that same year and was not able to run. Um, so that gave me more confidence, even though I was running really well, that if I get into the finals, I'm going to get a medal no matter what. The toughest, the toughest race for me was the semifinal race because you can't run too sketchy and you have to still save a little energy. But my coaches, my coaches uh, the way that he coached me to run the semifinals is always run the semifinals like a final. Because if you don't make it to the finals, there ain't no finals. And so it was it was a process to like, you know, try to run fast, but make sure I pull back because you want to get great lanes and that's how you get good lanes. But ultimately, I, I had definitely enough energy at the end because I, I, you know, I don't think I was even chosen to beat David Oliver. He was having a great year, too. And so for me, to, I had an injury that year. So for me to pull out a silver over David and he had already ran, I think, sub 13 that year uh, was amazing beast. <laughs> yeah yeah so but I, I i normally do well with my rounds i'm not a jump out the gate 13 old guy i'm more like a 13 3 13 1 13 0 i know how to run the rounds and and i actually learned that from terrence Tramel actually in like 2011 or 9 or something like that he made the team by one spot and I was like, oh, my gosh, he almost missed it. But really, it was him doing only what he had to do to make it to the next round. And sure enough, he was right next to me in the finals. And we ran the same time. They actually just gave it to me by a hundredth of a second, thank God. But it was like, oh, now I'm starting to understand how you run the rounds. You know, you don't run the rounds all out the first time because you're not going to have nothing left in the first round. But in the semis, you really do have to run that second round like the last because you need to make sure you're going to be in the last race. So that's how I, I do with the rounds. Excellent. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Great job. Great job. Yeah. Thank DP, you. Folks, deep pain. <laughs> over T pain. It's deep pain in the house. <laughs> so like, so, so when you run your rounds, yeah. um, do you run the semi the same way or do you focus more on the prelims or the finals? Unfortunately, I wasn't great. Like you got into the individual. <laughs> I had some injuries. Um, so, and I didn't run the rounds of the, the, uh, Olympics in the four by one. I just came in with the fresh legs in the final. To Got you. What do. But usually when I'm in those scenario running the hundreds and stuff and other events, um, first round, I still need to set the tone. So if they tell me top, whatever, um, top four, move on. If I feel like I want to win and set a statement, I'll win it. And let's exactly. move on as long as I'm. I'm conserving some of the energy. Um, back then, we usually have four rounds. Heats, mm -hmm. quarter, semi, and finals. Mm -hmm. um, semi, then it started getting a little bit uh, intense. But I'm usually ready for every round. Reasons why is most of the events, uh, rounds are usually early morning. Yes. So I, train, I get up and I train early anyway, so I'm always alert and awake. Others aren't. <laughs> right. Psychologically, emotionally, um, firing. They're not firing. They might be there physically. Emotionally, mentally, they could be still sleeping or checking out. <laughs> right. So that's something some of these guys have to, to watch in the rounds is make sure when they're preparing, they're preparing for morning, afternoon, and evening right. and be ready for that process to happen. Now with the time change, when you leave North America and go to Japan, there might be an issue is who might be jet lagged during that five-day scenario. Got you too. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's something they have to look at. So as soon as they get there, the question is, depends on what time they get there. So if they get there at um, 12 o'clock, 
I would say maybe take a quick power nap for an hour. Somebody got to wake them up, get going, and then go back to bed on normal time. At that, Japan top. Hey, hey not, Robert, that, that is the most essential rule when you start traveling. Everybody will tell you when you get over to Europe, don't go to bed. Because your sleep pattern is not going to be right. You, you, you fight through the sleep because if you get there at, you know, two or three or four, and you take that nap and you wake up at 10, yeah. you, you're up all night. You're on American time or you're wherever. And then you get to the meet. You're tired. You're not right. So you got to fight through that and make sure you wake up on it, too. And then, and then the time traveling, that the time is in the travel. Like we don't really talk about that either, but it wears and tears on your body. If you're if you're going to many places without resting, your your body's clock will get yep. out of whack. And so that's also something that you got to pay attention to. And the nervous system, because yes, you could be there physically. Yep. Right? Oh, right. But nervous system. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So you get, they have to make sure all those preparations are on point. So we have, we're, we're more likely watching the rounds to see who's still sleeping. Right. <laughs> that might be there physically. Who's not firing properly. Right. It's like you have right. a misfire in your car. And your pistol, uh oh, something misfiring. We got to chip, right? All those yeah. player roles and the right. performance right. aspects. Right. And then, like, I, I don't think, like, half my family, I mean, they knew I was in China, but I don't think they knew what time it was. And right. so I think we're 12 hours behind them. So my right. family was calling me at 1 a.m. So I'm like, uh, I race tomorrow. <laughs> so we're right. not on the same time. So That's I will already go have gotten my medal home. before y'all know. Airplane right. mode. Right. <laughs> Put them to sleep. <laughs> right. Hey, you gotta talk to Mom Dukes though. Got to talk to the Mom Dukes. Yes. But yeah, it was it was it was the, the time the, the time and the travel, the time changes, they definitely play a role. That's very important. You listen to your body. Yeah. All right. So now you're at the Olympics. Um, with all the volunteers, that's all around. Um, are you able to say thank you to them? Are you able to have interaction with them and appreciation? What does that look like for you as an athlete um, right. when you're out there on the, right. on the global stage? Um, yeah, man. Uh, I, I love the volunteers, man. They, they're they really like starting with the USATF volunteers. I mean, they're all over the U.S. when you go places and I've come to be cool with some of them because you see them at some of the meets that you go to as you're trying to get your your races together before you go overseas to compete and then you go overseas to compete when you start getting on the circuit you start seeing some of the same people massage therapists and people who just are there to be a part of the atmosphere or your housekeeper or the, the calf people because you know they're making it they're making it work for us they're making it happen for us so that we can go compete but um, I remember when I was at the Pan American Games and like before we left for the Pan American Games, we bought the staff on our floor pizza and we bought like 20 pizzas and we left it there. As we were leaving, they were coming up and they were all like, you know, teary eyed, really because they didn't expect us to do anything for them. And we gave them our pins and exchanged some of our clothes and stuff. And I'm sure they still have it and will always remember that. So. You gotta, you gotta really appreciate the volunteers because they're there doing stuff that they don't have to do to make everybody enjoy the Olympics. So that's a big, big thing. I totally agree with you. The unthankable part of the games, right? Right. The, the not in front appreciation. We understand. You know, exactly. without the games and these guys, there's no games. <laughs> right. The early morning, the preparation, all the other pieces, and. It doesn't matter what sport you're in. I want athletes to understand when you go to any event, you find the volunteers. You thank each and every one of them for the appreciation and hard work. And if you have gifts you want to give, great. Uh, all my kids that I coach, no matter what's happening, they're one of the most loved kids out there because of, I call it common sense and basic human things you're supposed to do. <laughs> it's thanks and appreciation. It right. goes a long way. 